All right, thanks. Thanks again for coming back to the uh, Foundations of Probability Seminar. This, this week's speaker is Mark Colliven from University of Sydney and Ludwig Maximilians University. And he'll be talking about the role of toy statistical models in legal reasoning. Thank you. And thanks everyone for coming along and for inviting me. Um, it's it's one, of the, one of the unexpected pleasures of the shutdown everywhere is that um, one still gets to give talks to interesting people all over the place and not have to travel to do it. So, you know, <laughs> I've been making use of this myself calling in old favors, getting people to come and give guest lectures in my, my uh, undergraduate courses even. It's, it's, it's sort of working out, um, one of, as I said, one of the unexpected pleasures of the shutdown is this kind of thing. So thanks again. Okay, so I, I'm gonna be talking rather than about the foundations of probability theory. So it's a bit of a, a odd paper for this series, I suspect. I'm gonna be talking about some applications of probability theory, and in particular, in legal reasoning. So it does, I think, raise some interesting foundational questions. And I, I have some tentative gestures of an answer to some of those questions. But most of you in, in this uh, Zoom meeting will have uh, much, much greater knowledge of this and many things to say about this, I hope. So I hope it at least prom prompts some discussion about foundational issues, because that's what I'm um, ultimately interested in, but the legal reasoning seems to me like an interesting way into some of these foundational questions. So I'm not sure how much people know about the use of probability in the law, so I'll, I'll assume nothing, but if I'm you know, uh, 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 you know, going too slowly and it's stuff you all know, please jump in and tell me to move on. I'm happy to do that. So the structure of the talk is just three sections. I'm going to talk about these toy models that are playing a really big role in uh, the discussions of statistics in the courtroom at the moment. And I'll then say a little bit about these models and in particular, why I think they're in many ways misleading and we should be moving past the toy models to the real cases. And then I'll say a little bit about the real cases at the end. I've got a couple of uh, real cases that I can discuss. I'm, I think I'll only have time to look at one of them, but um, I've got another one in reserve. If you'd like to hear about that, we can maybe say a bit about, more about that in discussion. But I'm, as I said, I, I, I'm keen to hear your views on this uh, as much as anything. So I, I wanna leave plenty of time for discussion. So legal probabilism, let's, let's start there. So probability in the law, they have a very checkered history. Um, many have been critical of the use of probability theory in the courtroom. Uh, famously, the, the great jurist Lawrence Tribe wrote a paper called Trial by Mathematics, uh, which is actually a very, very interesting long paper, very reasoned, discusses uh, uh, the use of statistics in the courtroom in great detail. But by the title alone, you kind of get a sense of the, 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 um, the conclusion of this paper that there's something wrong with the use of statistics in the courtroom. It should be trial by mathematics. Uh, Susan Hark um, has criticized what she calls legal probabilism. That's a, in, in, in for Susan, that's a pejorative term. Um, and legal probabilism basically is the idea that you should understand standards of evidence in probabilistic terms. Now, some of them it's kind of clear, right? So the uh, um, preponderance of evidence, there's really only one thing that could be, which is more probable than, than not, right? So it's a probability 0.5 greater than, less than, that, that matters there. So preponderance of evidence, that's kind of clear, but clear and convincing, beyond reasonable doubt in particular, are problematic, right? Um, but the legal probabilist is someone who thinks that you can, in principle at least, spell out those standards of evidence in probabilistic terms. So in a trial, criminal trial, where you're looking at beyond reasonable doubt, you will set some probability threshold. And once that's met, then you have uh, a reason to convict. So there are many concerns about statistics in the courtroom. Uh, some of them rather specific, like uh, instructions about how to and when to and when not to use likelihood ratios, Bayes theorem and the like. 
Here I'll focus on what is often called naked statistical evidence. And roughly the idea here is that statistical evidence without any other specific evidence about the individual in question. Hopefully the examples will help here. I, I say up front, I'm rather skeptical about this distinction in, from the get go, but those who are, are, are opposed to this think that you can get a clear idea of what this naked statistical evidence is. So let's start with some um, remarks about methodology and then I'll get onto the examples. So why are we heading towards these TWI examples? So first thing to say is that you could just look for cases where statistical evidence alone was used to convict. And there are such cases and they do crop up in these discussions. And then use those to argue that conviction runs counter to reasonable intuitions. So find a case where someone has been convicted by, you know, this bare naked statistical evidence and say there was an injustice there. That would be, and give some sort of argument as to why there was an injustice. That would be one way to approach this. The problem is that real cases are typically messy and it's hard to isolate the role that the nakedness of the statistical evidence is playing in delivering the intuitions. Um, and so instead, legal theorists and philosophers alike have turned to thought experiments or toy models to isolate the nakedness of the statistics in question. And this is a kind of familiar move from science, right? You like to know what's going on with a, you know, a, a water flowing through a mountain stream and there's just too much turbulence, there's too much friction, there's too many complications there. So you start studying isolated systems, water flowing through a smooth pipe. And even that turns out to be too difficult. So you start looking at idealized water flow through idealized pipes and the like effectively thought experiments. And you try and isolate the things that you're most interested in about the fluid flow and understand it in idealized conditions, either by setting up very carefully designed experiments in the lab or by thought experiments, both very common moves in science when the world gets too messy and complicated. So I can understand the reason that people move to these toy examples. And I think this is the motivation. The real cases in the law are just too messy and complicated. There's too much going on and all sorts of injustices are done in the courtroom, but for all different sorts of reasons. And you want to isolate those that are a result of this so-called bare statistical evidence. So the idea is to present an imagined case where the legal probabilist should be satisfied with conviction or with awarding damages in, in tort cases because the naked statistical evidence meets the relevant standard by construction. So you set it up so that the probabilities are high enough for, you, you, you tell me your standard, you tell me what you mean by beyond reasonable doubt. I'll set up an example where the, the, this case exceeds that standard and yet the intuition is that you shouldn't convict. That's the idea. Um, and you shouldn't convict in such a case because something is missing. This phrase keeps getting used. There's something missing. It's more than probability. So what could this something be? Well, it can't be probability, or so the argument goes, because you set it up precisely to make sure that the probability standard was met. So probabilism and naked statistical evidence have at best a limited role to play in the courtroom. Not so, the, 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 the opponents of legal probabilism, um, such as Susan Hark, are not, to be very clear, not suggesting there's no room for probability or statistics in the courtroom, but that it can't be the whole story. That's the, that's the claim. Maybe there are some who think there's no role for them to play, but I, 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 the people I'm addressing, people like Susan Hark, take this stuff seriously. It's just they think that there's, there's more to it than just probability. Okay, so that's just sort of motivation. Uh, Can I ask a question? Is, is, <clears throat> would this view, uh, the way you characterize Susan Hock's view, would that, would that not be the sign of, you know, you know, very, very high majority view among lawyers and philosophers and everybody else? Uh, it's, it's hard to tell. I mean, I think of the legal scholars that, that dip their toe into these waters, 
philosophers of law and uh, statisticians as well and uh, uh, lawyers, I think something like Susan's view would be the majority. But you, you find some interesting claims. So people say, for instance, that the law backs this up. The law resoundingly rejects naked statistical evidence. But that's just not what I see. I mean, in tort law, for instance, you see class actions succeeding all the time based on as close to pure statistical evidence as you can get. So I, I think the law is genuinely torn on this issue. And I think the law, not surprisingly, is inconsistent about its use of statistics. But as amongst the legal scholars, I, I think that's right, Glenn. I think that something like Susan's view is, is probably the majority view here. So I'm um, in the minority here. I think that, you know, to show my hand from the get-go, I think it is all probability. Um, and I think uh, I'll, I'll say a little bit about that as we go through, but I think I, I take Susan's view very carefully. In fact, very seriously on pretty much all things, but I, I you know, and I, I've got another paper. I won't talk about Susan's views in great detail here, but I've got another paper where I discuss her criticisms of legal probabilism, a paper with Brian Hedden, who I think I spoke, I think spoke to your group recently. And, um, you know, we go through Susan's criticisms of probabilism and show how the probabilist could reply. But at the end of the day, there's probably not a great deal of difference between us. I mean, she thinks in a way that classical probability theory is ill-equipped to do the job that you need it to do. You know, and we just think that there are various other forms of probability theory that can do the job. Anyway, so now to the toy cases. Does that answer your question, Glenn? Uh, yes, it answers my question. <laughs> so, I, I just, if, if I could just uh, clarify, you, you, maybe you just answered it. It was, uh, when you say probability, you don't necessarily, are, are you, do you necessarily mean mathematical, you know, the probability that is used in statistics, the type of mathematical probability, or just probability in general as a concept? Uh, I, I, I'm, I, I mean the, the probability of, uh, it, as used in mathematics, but there are different, uh, you know, as you guys know better than me, there, there are various forms of probability can take. So we could have Kolmogorov probability, we could have, I'm going to be very liberal about what I mean by probability, but I do think of it mathematically. Okay. So you might have sort of some sort of interval interval probability. You might have, you know, um, yeah, uh, Dempster-Schafer belief functions. You know, they're, they're, I'm going to be very liberal about what I count as probability. But for the most part, think of it as classical probability and not classical interpretation, but, you know, Kolmogorov probability. But <laughs> I will gesture towards non-classical probabilities at various points. Uh, okay, so here are the, the examples. The, these will be familiar to most of you, I suspect. So the blue bus case, most famous of them. Mrs. Brown is run down by a bus. 60% of the buses that travel along the street in question are owned by the blue bus company, 40% by the red bus company. The only witness is colorblind. Given the lack of further information, one could argue that there is a 0.6 probability that Mrs. Brown was run down by a blue bus. Yet the overwhelming intuition is that 60% statistic here is not sufficient for Mrs. Brown to prove her case in a civil trial. Uh, just think about that for a moment. If you haven't seen this before, what your own intuition is here. Um, and it's worth thinking of each of these toy models to be contrasted with another very similar case. So suppose that, for instance, Mrs. Brown was run down by a bus and the only witness, rather than being colorblind, was only 60% reliable with determining the color of the bus. Right? It was dark or the person wasn't looking very carefully, whatever, whatever the reason that they were 60% reliable. So it was an eyewitness testimony with 0.6 probability that they identify the color of the bus correctly. Most people in this debate, at least, are inclined to say that would be fine for, for a awarding of damages in a civil case, but the pure frequency of buses on the road is not. Um, I'd say up front, I don't share that intuition, but 
that's the that's the intuition that's supposed to be driven by these examples and to get an idea of what is intended by naked statistical evidence this is a good exemplar right so what's supposed to be going on here is you have nothing no information about the accident itself all you have is information about the frequencies of buses on this street and that's supposed to be uh what this naked statistical evidence is and note that in this case the, con the construction just as i said in the marks about methodology the construction is 0.5 is supposed to be sufficient for uh, the preponderance of evidence which is all that's required in a civil case like this so you've just got to meet the 0.5 standard we do that easily by making the setting the thing up to be 60 percent 40 percent bus ratio and so the probabilist, it seems, has no ground to stand on when they say, if, if they share this intuition, that this wouldn't be enough. It can't be because the probability is not high enough, because clearly 0.5 is the, the level, and we've set it up to be 0.6. If you want to be higher, make it 70 and 30, and it's supposed to not change. So you, by construction, you meet the probability standard that the probabilist is, uh, assigns to the relevant standard of evidence here and then argue that, that that still there's something missing so okay. you make this so you make this naked by refusing to allow the bus driver to deny that it happened or yeah. <laughs> exactly uh, we'll, we'll we'll get to that in due course that's exactly right you you rule out everything else no, the eyewitness must be colorblind you can't have another eyewitness who saw a little bit of the accident or saw a a suspicious looking bus drive off you all of that is ruled out by fiat and you and again back to I, I i'm going to criticize all of this in due course but i just for the moment want to make sure everybody you know at least feels some of the force that these the examples are supposed to to carry um but again notice the sort of similarity to scientific experiments right you want to exclude all of that other stuff by fiat right so you say i want to just show that the naked statistical evidence on its own is not enough so i have to exclude all that other stuff so that you can understand the the idea behind the the thought experiment just as with a real experiment if i want to study water flowing through a stream i exclude the rocks in the stream i exclude all the stuff that makes things complicated so that i get a grip on what's going on with say laminar flow or whatever in, in a water through a pipe um, so you, you study things under, under either uh, laboratory conditions or in thought experiment conditions so that you can isolate the thing that you're interested in, the hypothesis at, at issue. And the hypothesis at issue here is that naked statistical evidence is or is not enough. So yes, absolutely. We exclude all other things. It's just the frequencies here. And to be fair, there are cases that are very similar to this. There are real legal cases that are very similar to this. Second toy model. Can I ask you a couple of questions? Yeah. This is Barry Lower. What One question is, what do you exactly do you mean by reliable? Do you mean that's the probability that Mrs. Brown would say, or not Mrs. Brown, the, the, that the witness would say it's a blue bus if it is a blue bus and say it's a blue bus if it's a brown bus? So reliable with the with the second case that I contrasted this with, where I said her reliability is 0.6. So but those reliability would be some conditional probabilities. I just don't know which they are. That's right. So the, the so the reliability, there's two reliabilities here, as, as you point out. So if you're talking about with with the frequency case, we don't need to talk about reliability, right? It's just the frequency of the buses. Right. But I said to contrast this case with another case where the, the witness, it was nothing to do with the frequency of the buses, it was just the reliability of the witness. And they said that, suppose that the witness is 60% reliable with re identifying uh, blue buses. There's, there's two reliabilities there actually, there's false positives and false negatives we need to take into account. Right. Um, for most of these discussions, people use a witness who's just 60% reliable across the board. So they're 60% reliable at identifying the color of the bus. So it's effectively their false positive and false negative rates will be symmetric in that way. 
but the but the 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 main toy model we're interested in doesn't have any talk about reliability it's just about the the frequency of the buses and that's that we'll get to again in, in due course, but what's interesting about that is we're asked to accept that information with 100% reliability, right? Those are the figures. 60% of the buses traveling along this street are owned by the blue bus company, 40% are red. And there's no further question about that. And again, that's done deliberately to set things up so that you can not be concerned about other kinds of uncertainty here. Does that answer, Barry? Yeah, okay, I'll move on. So the second toy model, prisoners, 100 prisoners are exercising in prison yard, 99 of them are suddenly join in a planned attack on a prison guard. The 100th prisoner plays no part. There's no evidence available to show who joined in and who did not. So is the 0.99 probability that a randomly chosen prisoner is guilty enough to prove beyond reasonable doubt that he or she is guilty? The intuition again that we're supposed to all have here is that it's not. Um, and this does not seem to be explained by the fact that 0.99 is not high enough to satisfy beyond reasonable doubt. The intuition is still there if we increase the number of prisoners to 1000. And in any case, 0.99, whatever you mean by beyond reasonable doubt as a probabilist, it's surely you know, um, lower than that. So the, the again, the structure of the thought experiment here is Tell me what you mean by beyond reasonable doubt. Let's suppose I say 0.95 and you say, okay, I set up this experiment, the thought experiment. I've got hundred prisoners. One was not involved. So my probability here is gonna be 0.99. That meets your standard, you say to me. So this should be a, a case where you should be absolutely happy with a conviction of a randomly chosen prisoner and yet so the story goes, our intuitions tell us that that's not enough. So again, we've got naked statistical evidence being inadequate for a conviction. So the previous case is civil, right? So this is a civil case. We're looking at talking about damages. So we want a 0.5 probability here. Here we want something higher, whatever beyond reasonable doubt means, but surely 0.99 meets that if it doesn't as I said, just alter the thought experiment to, to fix that. But this is a criminal case. So that's why these two very often go together. In case you think that it's something, for instance, just about uh, civil trials, damage award of damages, that somehow statistical evidence doesn't work there. Um, this is supposed to show that it shouldn't, it is not enough even in criminal trials. Uh, another case called gate crasher, a promoter sells 499 tickets to a Rodeo, yet the Rodeo is attended by 1,000 people. 501 attendees have not purchased tickets, so a gate crashes. The promoter sues a random attendee for non-payment of the ticket. Since it's a civil case, preponderance of evidence is the appropriate standard. Moreover, since more than half the attendees are gate crashes, this standard of evidence is clearly met. Yet there's a strong intuition that we're supposed to have at least on the part of some that where that um, were the law suit successful, it would be unjust. Okay, and again, you can see same kind of structure, just set things up by fiat such that the probabilities are the way you want them to be and then rule out all other kinds of evidence by fiat and then say, this wouldn't be enough. And it's not a question of the probabilities not being high enough. It's just that there's something missing. That's the, that's the idea here. Okay, so a word of caution now about these thought experiments. So when constructing thought experiments, you need to make sure that one, the situation is coherent and well understood. Two, does not invite the reader to bring in any additional, additional baggage that might get in the way and three, I claim it just needs to isolate the hypothesis in question. And all of these have been designed to do this. I mean, I think this is common, common ground. Everybody thinks this is what thought experiments need to do. You, you can't just describe or under describe a situation where it's not clear what's going on. Um, it's got to be coherent, it's got to be well understood. Again, work in the social sciences, um, people who construct vignettes, for instance, 
to find out people's intuitions about this, that, and the other, to be very, very careful about constructing the vignettes. A great deal of work in social science and psychology goes into this, making sure that the thing, what you're describing is coherent, that it's understood the same way that you understand it. You don't want someone else reading this thing and thinking of it in a different way. So a great deal of work goes into making sure that the situation is coherent, well understood, and well understood in the same way by all parties. Doesn't invite the reader to bring in additional baggage. You don't want them to sort of, even though you didn't say that the red bus company was critically dangerous and always having accidents, you don't want them to just import that into the into the story. Um, hence, you don't give names like, for instance, the safe bus company and the dangerous bus company, right? You don't use names like that. Use red and blue. And that it isolates the hypothesis in question. And clearly, that's what's intended here to try and get this concept of naked statistical evidence isolated and show that that can't do the work that it's supposed to do for the legal probabilist. I, I think there's good reason to doubt that these models, at least these toy models satisfy these conditions. Um, and I think we also need to distinguish the epistemic question of probability of guilt and liability from the decision theoretic question of punishment and damages. This is often overlooked in, in um, legal discussions often thought that once you've pronounced someone as guilty that the punishment just follows naturally from that uh, i'm inclined to think that actually jury decisions is a decision theoretic um, uh, should be set up decision theoretically from the get-go because what they're asked to do is to perform an action to pronounce guilty or not guilty, right? So you may, for instance, think that someone is innocent, but um, for various reasons, think that it's uh, prudent to uh, pronounce guilty or vice versa. I'm sure that goes on. You might think that this person is, is guilty, but there's insufficient evidence given the punishment that's on offer and you pronounce not guilty. So that he, the actions that flow from these epistemic um, question of probability of guilt and liability are quite distinct from the decision theoretic stuff. And I think that's not always appreciated. So we can think there's some room to move here is what I'm suggesting. You might think, for instance, sure, the probabilities are in favor of um, this person being guilty or being liable, but I'm unwilling to punish them based on that for decision theoretic reasons. There's nothing to do, nothing wrong with the probabilities there. But in the sense of, is this a view that could be published in a law journal? It, 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 it. The, the decision theoretic approach. Yeah, is it acceptable to legal doctrine the way it's taught? I mean, I'm not, not to disagree with you, but it, it seems like um, you're stepping outside the debate that's that of, of legal scholars. If I may say that, uh, I, I actually I don't think so. I, I think there's lots of reason to think that the, the, that the decision they don't talk in decision theoretic terms, but I think one can make sense of a great deal of legal practice in decision theoretic terms. So why do you have different standards of evidence, for instance? Okay, that's very easy to sort of understand that decision theoretically, right? Why is it that juries seem to be a little bit, or at least I'd like to hope the decision that the juries are a bit more cautious when a death penalty is on offer. Um, the, the reason that the beyond reasonable doubt is left um, somewhat vague, I think is so that it can be flexible for, for precisely these reasons. Certainly I know if I were a jurist sitting on a, on a, a panel for something that I knew that a death penalty was on offer, my standard of what beyond reasonable doubt would be would be extraordinarily high compared to uh, you know other other crimes. So I think the flex the flexibility that you have with interpretation of these is well under is easy to understand decision theoretically. Not to say that you know decision theoretic that's that's the way the courts work, but I think you know one one can give a rational reconstruction of at least a great deal of what goes on. What you're saying is certainly right in civil cases, because people think the lawyers think about exactly how much damage is to, to, to be asking for. And that'll be, you know, that's be a consideration. That's right. Years. 
Yeah, and I, I have I have published in a law journal on on this sort of pushing this this view, the decision theoretic view. Um, I'm not going to make a lot of it here. I just think it is worth noting that part of the reluctance to convict in some of these cases or award damages might be for decision theoretic reasons, not for the probabilities, right? This would be that you just think, yes, I'm, I, I do believe that this red bus company, sorry, blue bus company uh, were responsible for the accident, but for decision theoretic reasons to do with utilities, I'm inclined not to, to award damages in this case. That, that is a possibility. I'm not gonna make much of that, but I think that that's not isolated for a start by these, these thought experiments. Okay, shall I go on? Okay, so let's go back to these toy models. Blue bus again, I won't go through it again. So let's just note what we're being asked to imagine here. My view, we're being asked to imagine something very unreasonable, that there is no further information. Right? You, you stipulate the frequencies of buses is all there is. And it's really hard to do that, right? You kind of think, I know, for instance, that buses don't run randomly. I know that buses have timetables. <laughs> and you could, the fact that you're calling this thing a bus suggests that there's this further information. So one, one reading this, when one's reading this example, one naturally fills in the impoverished scenario with a bit of realistic detail. This is very, very common and well-known in social sciences. If you say, imagine you're standing in a room Someone kind of pictures details of the room that you have. You haven't told them that there are pictures on the wall or the walls are painted. You're, you're standing in my living room. You imagine that I have painted walls. You imagine that there's some furniture. You imagine all this extra stuff because you use the word my living room. Right? But I didn't tell you that I've got furniture. I didn't tell you that I've got paint on the walls. And yet what we're told here is that there's this bus running down the street. And the only information we have is the frequency of buses very natural for us to bring in this extra information. So we know that buses don't run randomly across long streets. There are bus timetables. Might also ask about accident rates of the two companies. Um, as Glenn noted, we, we could also ask the driver of this particular bus. We know that there are, there are uh, not only timetables, but schedules for the bus drivers. So the bus, we can identify which bus driver was on the bus at that particular time and we can interview the bus driver. There's all this extra stuff we could do. So moreover, this extra information in an, if were this a real case, right? Because it's a thought experiment, all of this stuff is excluded by fiat, but we naturally bring some of this to bear on the, on the thought experiment itself. But were this a real case, such information is usually freely available and accessible. So it's clearly important information and it's free and simple value of information, <laughs> Fairy will tell you, you should seek this information. Moreover, ignoring such freely available information may completely undermine the probabilistic assessment delivered by the toy model. So for instance, if you find out, for instance, that the blue buses don't run at that time of day anywhere. So it was a nighttime accident. The blue buses stopped running at five o'clock. To find out that information, suddenly the statistical model that you use to get the 0.6 probability that it was a blue bus is completely undermined. It's not changes it a little bit, the model is invalid. So in real cases, we know there is such information, we'd be inclined to seek it out, not because we doubt the point, the 60% proportion of buses and 40% red buses, although that's another thing you might doubt. You might think exactly, there are exactly 100 buses in this town and exactly 60 of them blue. Can I see the data on that? Um, you know, there, there, there's reason to be doubtful in normal situations about such, such, probability, uh, such frequency data. But again, we're just supposed to just accept that with 100% confidence. Again, completely unreasonable. And so I think what happens in this case is that we are asked to imagine a very, very unreasonable setup and we very naturally bring in extra stuff and that extra stuff gets in the way of this being a purely, purely na uh, uh, um, naked probability assignment. Toy model two, the prison yard. 
again, everything that I said a moment ago applies here as well. Again, we have no further information about what went on the prison yard. You know, really? Really? No video surveillance? No testimony? Can't talk to the people? Can't ask the you know, other prison guards? There were no witnesses? This is all completely unreasonable. And uh, to be fair to the, this, the design of the thought experiment, it's unreasonable because you deliberately want to exclude that stuff so that you can isolate the nakedness of the statistical evidence. But my claim here, and this is, you know, again, well backed up by um, design in social sciences experiments, people naturally bring this stuff in. And you've got to fill, either fill the detail in such a way that it doesn't matter, but just leaving it out and saying that there is no further evidence is just not the way to do it. The social science experiments are usually designed a little bit more carefully than this. But here there's another problem as well. And I'll just say that I think it matters whether you prosecute a randomly selected prisoner or all 100. And this is usually left ambiguous in the, in the setup in this, this thought experiment. So why does this matter? Prosecuting just one prisoner introduces issues of justice that are completely independent of issues about naked statistical evidence. So for instance, consider a parking inspector who finds 10 cars illegally parked and issues a parking ticket to only one. That person I think could rightly say, that was not fair, I should not have got a parking ticket here. Not because there's any doubt about their guilt, right? They were illegally parked. Let's just specify that they definitely were illegally parked, but so were nine others and they didn't get parking tickets. So there's a quite reasonable worry about justice here. So if what you're saying in the prison yard is that I will randomly select one and only one prisoner and prosecute them for the assault on the guard, that raises, you, and, you, uh, and like many people, you're reluctant to, to uh, think that that, that uh, criminal case should succeed. It may well be because you think of, Reasons, reasons of injustice. The other 98 have got off scot-free. Okay, so the intuition that any single prisoner should not be found guilty and punished in isolation can be accounted for, I think, by this observation about justice. So to, again, we need to specify the details of this, this thought experiment in a little more detail. So for instance, if you change it to, to I prosecute all 100, it's not so clear any longer that the intuition that that's not justified. I mean, at least I, I put my cards on the table again. I don't share that intuition. Sure, one person in that 100 is innocent and you're convicting an innocent person, but that's the fallibility you have when you're dealing with the law in general, right? There's nothing special about that. Um, but the reluctance to prosecute just one of the 100, I think that can be fully explained by issues to do with justice. And the original form of this thought experiment does not clarify that. It just talks about a randomly selected prisoner. And it's not clear that you're picking one randomly, but you're ultimately going to, to prosecute all of them. But if you do set up the, the experiment in such a way that you prosecute all of them, I don't think it delivers the results. Certainly, it's not uniform. Um, I've, I've asked lots of people about this, and people become really unclear about whether their intuitions go in favour of prosecution or not once you specify that it's 100. Okay, um, Toy Model 3, the gate crash up. Nothing more to say about this. I think it's just the same as the previous cases. The issues to do with the unreasonable idealization should you are asked to imagine here, no further information. And again, this issue of justice crops up there. Uh, picking one person out of the crowd and prosecuting them while all the others, that, that does seem unfair. And there's good reason to really be reluctant to um, uh, uh, see a civil case succeed in, in such circumstances. So what's the, what's the status of these toy models then? So I should be clear, this is not an attack on thought experiments in general. Um, I do have my reservations to be, to be again upfront. I do have some reservations about thought experiments in general, but that's not what I'm about today. 
So it's not a, an attack on them in general, just that as with real experiments, they need to be carefully designed. You know, the history of science is littered with examples where poorly designed experiments delivered you know, um, dodgy results or experiments that were thought to be well designed at the time, but were later found to be flawed and they're improved upon as we went through. So again, this is not an attack on the authors of these thought experiments. I think they're really ingenious. I think they served a great purpose in getting these discussions going. But at the end of the day, I don't think they isolate the hypotheses that they're supposed to isolate. So in particular, thought experiments need to be designed so that the hypothesis in question is isolated or near enough. You might think you never completely isolate a single hypothesis for reasons of you know, Duham, Quine, holism or whatever but you do your best to try and isolate and maybe to conduct multiple experiments to try and triangulate on the isolated hypothesis so the thought experiments that take center stage in the naked statistical evidence debate though i just don't think do this um, so those who would argue that there's something missing with naked statistical evidence i think they just need to design better thought experiments and maybe there are such thought experiments maybe you can improve upon these thought experiments to get the uh, you, you know, the intuitions that you would like from um, you know, better designed cases. But I'll leave that for those who are more sympathetic towards the thesis that they're trying to defend. Another approach, and this is the approach I'm inclined to take, is to think that let's just go with the real cases, messy though they may be, let's try and understand what's going on in real, real legal cases, because I think we've been distracted by these thought experiments. I just don't think they work. I think they're failing for various reasons. And let's focus on real legal cases. And there are some cases that I don't think there's naked statistical evidence and only naked statistical evidence, but there are some cases that are close enough. And in particular, cold hit DNA matches are pretty close to the mark here. So DNA evidence provides extremely high probabilities, well beyond reasonable doubt. Uh, is there a problem with standalone DNA evidence? Is there something missing in these cases? So the, the cases I have in mind here in case people have not come across these is where you just find some DNA at a crime scene that you believe for various reasons to come from the perpetrator and then you just do a cold search of a database and find a match. No other evidence, no other, you know, look, typically in these, these um, DNA evidence cases, what you find is you have a couple of suspects already, or you've got someone that you suspect is guilty of the crime. And then you do a DNA attached D DNA uh, match to seal the deal. But there are these cases where there's been nothing else but the DNA match. You just troll through a, a database and, until you get a match. So these are what we call cold hit DNA matches. Um, and there is something to be, again, there's just some suspicion of these cases. There have been some cases that have been successful, but people have been suspicious of them. So is there a problem with standalone DNA evidence? And that's what I mean by standalone, nothing else, just the DNA evidence. Is there something missing? So under ideal conditions, the chance of a false positive is about 10 to the minus 11 and getting smaller as the, as the um, methods improve. Uh, but last time I looked, it was about 10 to the minus 11, the probability of a false positive. Any other evidence, eyewitness testimony, much less reliable than this. We know that we have a lot of, a lot of evidence on how unreliable eyewitness tes testimony is, but the proviso of under ideal conditions is important here. So if the figures that we typically get quoted for DNA matches like 10 to the minus 11 as the probability of a false positive assumes that everything's gone well in the lab, there's no sample contamination, no sample contamination at the crime scene and so on and so forth. So that needs to be taken into account though, of course. We need to know what the probability of sample contamination in the lab is and the crime scene and so on and so forth. And that you might think of as probabilities outside the statistical model that we're interested in. So the, the statistical model that delivers 10 to the minus 11 as a probability of a false positive is kind of within the, the DNA 
matching statistical model. And then you've got questions about the reliability of that model. So were the, were, was the DNA collection um, reliable? Was it from a contaminated part of the crime scene? Did the lab get it right? Can we have statistics on the reliability of this lab versus other labs? And again, to be fair, there are studies along these lines. People are doing this kind of work, looking at um, error rates in labs. So you can do this stuff. This is not problematic. It's just that you do need to do it. But it's interesting to note that this seems to be probabilities about the reliability of the statistical model rather than an extra feature within the statistical model. So for instance, just to get a handle on this, if you were to find that the DNA gathered from the crime scene matched the lead detective on the case, you might ask some questions of the lead detective on the case, but by and large, you're gonna think that that's just an contaminated crime scene. And so you're not gonna say, for instance, that the probability comes down from 10 to the minus 11 to something a little bit lower, you're inclined to just dismiss the statistical model completely, right? No, it was gathered from a contaminated scene. So we dismiss that and move on. So it does seem to be with outside of the statistical model that you're using, what I'm thinking of as meta uncertainties. They're about the probabilities that you, the primary first order prob probabilities that you're interested in. So dealing with meta uncertainty, and I think this kind of jumps out at you when you look at real cases. It's, it's, it's clearly worried about in the law. And as what the problems with the toy cases is they just set this aside. And I don't think you can reasonably set this meta uncertainty aside. And it's clearly present in real cases and it's clearly dealt with. So think of meta uncertainty as an uncertainty about the statistical model. Such uncertainty is not resolved by making the first order probability smaller or larger, right? Typically, we need another statistical model you know, to model the screw ups in the DNA lab, for instance, and you can construct such models. There's a, there's a worry here that you're heading on an infinite regress, then you're gonna have meta uncertainty about that and so on and so forth. But at least addressing the uncertainty about the first order probabilities via some statistical model at the second order level would be an improvement. And, Again, this is not news. This is, this is stuff, work that is going on. Um, what's worrying about this is this, this is a general form of uncertainty that in the scientific literature gets called model uncertainty. So it's what model uncertainty does in general in science is invalidates the model. So once you find that you've got a model that tells you, for instance, that the population of Australia will be 26 million in this, at such and such a time, and then you find out that the model was based on completely, completely unreasonable assumptions, you're inclined to dismiss that model completely. It undermines that this is a sort of feature of model uncertainty. It very often just completely undermines the model and all bets are off. And that can happen here, right? Just, just the example I give is, uh, just like a, a single typo can completely invalidate a computer program. You don't think, oh, my computer program's got a typo in it, but it should give close to the right result, even though it's got one mistake in it. Quite often the thing just doesn't run at all. So how do we go about bolstering the statistical evidence that we're interested in? Here's, the, here's my much more hand wavy tentative suggestions about how to improve things. So probabilities in DNA cases, I think are, are misleading, there's 10 to the minus 11, and this is widely acknowledged that they're only under ideal conditions. The issue of meta uncertainty is often ignored um, apart from the st statisticians involved in these cases. But in the pure legal setting, people often just quote these figures as if they're uncontroversial. Um, so how might the statistical evidence be improved? Well, we could establish relevant causal pathways. This is one thing you can do how tell a story about how the dna in question got to where it was why you believe that that dna is from the perpetrator um, it doesn't have to be mapped out the whole causal network in question but telling plausible causal stories about why that dna is from the perpetrator and not from contamination from the crime scene for instance 
Um, you could provide an account of meta uncertainty, for instance, for example, uh, statistics on failures of the lab and contamination of crime scenes. Again, work that's being done. Perhaps representing meta uncertainty via some form of interval probabilities or sets of probability distributions. Again, um, familiar to, to people in this group, I'm sure. And perhaps perform a sensitivity analysis on the statistical models. So sometimes it doesn't matter that your statistical model is inaccurate in various ways because any reasonable way of fixing it would deliver more or less the same result. You can sometimes get lucky in that way and doing sensitivity analysis as, analyses will deliver that. Um, more generally, we can look for ways to triangulate that is, we can always guard against, we can't always, sorry, guard against mistakes in the lab, but we, you can check that the accused had the opportunity to commit the crime in question. That's a really basic test, right? Um, the law, interestingly, requires, usually at least, means, motive and opportunity. These are sort of the three big things in prosecution in criminal cases. The way I think of these is not as extra requirements taking priority over statistical evidence, Rather, they're basic checks that all is in order with statistical model in the first place. So there's something missing is epistemic in nature in my book. It will rather meta epistemic, if you like, it's sort of concerns about the epistemic models that are being used in the first order. And these checks, if you can think about it, lots of, there are lots of cases where we do things like this. Um, back in my undergraduate days, I can remember my physics lecturer telling me, you can use these newfangled calculators if you like, but if you ever give me a ridiculous answer that's an order of magnitude out, I will, I will confiscate all, my, all calculators in the classroom, right? Check it mentally. Does that answer make sense? Because it's so easy to press in the wrong number and get a ridiculous answer that's an order of magnitude out, whereas your intuition should just double check when you get an answer. Think, does that make sense? And that's what I think of as means, motive, and opportunity. Does it make sense? You did this database search, you found a cold hit, and reasonable question to ask is, was that person in the country at the time? Was this person in the area at the time? Why, why would this person want to kill that person? Why would this person, did, did they, have the means to do this. If there was using some sort of complicated device for the murder, was this person capable of doing this? So means, motive and opportunity, even in cold hit cases, are a way of testing the reliability of your statistical model. And I think quite rightly, rightly so. So I think you know, the law gets a lot of this right. And when you look at real cases. Um, I've got another case, but it'll take a little little time to get through. So I think that's enough to hopefully start a bit of discussion. So I might just end things there. So thanks for your attention. <laughs>